Okay, we're, uh, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence here. We are so thankful for the light that you have given us and for the time that we have to study together. I'm thankful for the individuals who are searching for truth. And we pray, Lord, that um, you can use this study, uh, this medium of videos and Zoom uh, to reach those who are looking for truth. We pray, Lord, also as well that you can help us to desire um, to understand not just abstract truths, but to know you personally through the things that you have revealed in your word and in nature. And we ask, Lord, that you can be with us now through thy spirit and guide and direct in this study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Now, when we were um, going through the study uh, on Thursday, so it's a lot of stuff has happened since then, uh, Roe versus Wade, uh, the studies that we had uh, Friday night and, um, and, and on Sabbath, and now we're coming back again to this study, and I had reviewed this um, line of Parminder, which I'm going to bring up here in a minute. Now, um, what was the one point? Okay, so, so one of the things we have to consider it, when we're looking here at Judges chapter 4, so let's look at these scriptures here first. Um, we're dealing with this, uh, these verses. As we look into them, we see lots of symbolism. Some of the symbolism we haven't really uh, come to understand fully, the 900 chariots of iron. Uh, we're not really sure what that means as a symbol. Um, the 20 years we addressed. We have Deborah, the prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth. She's this judge. And, and we've taken this position that this relates to the spirit of prophecy in some way. Uh, we dealt with the symbol of the palm tree that Deborah dwells under. And also the location where this is, Ramah and Bethel. It's between these two in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel are coming to her for judgment. So the children of Israel here must represent those who are looking for truth. Um, and in, in understanding the context then of Parminder, we had drawn this line. And which we're, I'll just bring this up, I guess. Look at this line again. Uh, oops. So... Here I, I drew them out. We looked at this on uh, Friday night again. So just a simple review of these lines. What you see at the top is the line of the Millerites, the two periods ending in 1798 on February 15th. You're going to see Miller's receiving his credentials on September 14th, 1833. And then you have the empowerment on August 11th, 1840. April 19th is the arrival of the second angel, and then we have Midnight and Midnight Cry, July 21st, August 15th, and then, of course, um, October 22nd, 1844, the arrival of the third angel. Now, we have paralleled to that, that line to ours because we're a repeat of history. And, and more specifically, uh, we know that on Ellen White's line, the next way mark that she places is... Um, the Sunday law. So she's she has October 22nd, 1844, the arrival of the third angel's message. It's going to be joined by the angel of Revelation 18, and it will swell then to a loud cry. And she compares that loud cry to the midnight cry of Millerite history. So, so when we have this repeat of history, which is our line, this precedes the Sunday law. This is the repeating of the first and second angels' messages, the parable of the ten virgins. And 
when we, we lay this line out, one of the things we see is that 9-11 is a singular event in our history, but it, it parallels two events in Millerite history. That's August 11th, 1840 and April 19th, 1844, with the empowerment of the first and the arrival of the second angel. So when we draw out the line in the way that I have here, this center line starting on November 9th, 1989, we have the formalization, the empowerment, the arrival of the second angel. Its formalization, empowerment, I would see is still future. And the Sunday law is still future. And, and in understanding the lines, we know that in this movement right now, there isn't a complete understanding of the lines. That is, some people are looking for the Sunday law as imminent, but we haven't had midnight or the midnight cry occur yet because we know that that has to do with the message given to Seventh-day Adventists. And so to expect the Sunday law prior to us accomplishing the task that was put before us doesn't really make any sense. But that's, that's where people stand in this movement at the present time for the most part. They're looking at that. Um, they're looking at this line incorrectly. But, but that's sort of besides the point as far as addressing Parminder. But one thing we can say is that uh, we believe that uh, the period of the judges is representing history from 9-11 to at least 2023 and maybe even further. But one of the things about 9-11 that the problem is, is we have, not, of course, I know 9-11 is a singular event, but if we're going to be drawing something on a line, we need to know which 9-11 we are looking at. That is, are we looking at the 9-11 that's the empowerment of the first angel's message or the 9-11 that is the arrival of the second? Now, so in Parminder's line, my view, whether I'm correct or not, is that Parminder's line is a zoom on to 9-11 and I'm leaning towards that it's the arrival of the second angel's message. That is, it's we take that way mark, that's the arrival of the second angel. And that way mark is, um, is 2014. So when we look at this line here, so we look at this center line, and, and hopefully people can see this quite well. But we know that 9-11, even though it can represent both of these events or, or, or both of these waymarks, it can't represent them both at the same time. That is, it represents the arrival of the second angel if we're looking at the line in a particular way. It represents the empower empowerment of the first angel if we're looking at the line in another way. And we haven't really defined how we would look at these lines to understand where 9-11 is. But if 9-11 is sunset, which is April 19th, which is sunset, because midnight has to be halfway between sunset and sunrise, and they looked at October 22nd as sunrise, and they looked at April 19th at sunset. So that's why when snows at Boston, he can say how long is a night? Six months. And how long to midnight? Three months. And how long have we been in the tarrying time? Just three months, right? So, so that means we can have 9-11 be sunset. But when it is sunset, that is when it's represent representing April 19th, one of the ways that Chawatu had addressed this is he just said that 9-11 is the empowerment of the first angel and that the sunset or the arrival of the second would be 2014. And I think that he's right if he's looking at the line in a particular way. That is, even though we have 9-11 there, and so maybe, maybe we, we need sort of a discussion on this. So if I put this as 2014, so I'm just going to do this just for a visual. 
Now, if I say that this is 2014, that means I'm not putting 9-11 here as the arrival of the second angel, right? So that's going to be sunset, but it's going to be 2014. And so this is what I mean when I'm saying that Parminder's line is actually a zoom into this 2014 way mark. But that 2014 way mark is not 9-11, right, in this context. Does that make sense to anyone? You're making a point, flesh it out just a little bit more. Okay. So 9-11 is a singular event. And it serves two purposes on our line, but not at the same time. That is, it is the arrival of the second angel, but it's also the empowerment of the first angel. Agreed. Right. But if I am using 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel, the arrival of the second angel occurs within this movement in a way that we would have to recognize that it's 2014. That is, we can't have it be both things at the same time. So in this, in this situation, as we were addressing on Thursday, mm -hmm. we could see that there were lines that gave good reference to that of Rome. And that we could establish way marks based upon what we were seeing from this with Rome. So are we then addressing Parminder's line in a similar manner as we did that with the lines that have to do with Rome? Okay, so, so the lines dealing with Rome, can you explain what those are? Well, we know that we know that there is going to be a false narrative that's going to precede the true. Okay, a counterfeit. A counterfeit. And we were addressing some of that having to deal with um, Fatima and how the different popes were, re were reacting with Fatima. Right. So they have a counterfeit reform line, which is- Correct. Reform line. And then they have- they have it historically in the past, but they also have it like, like, I mean, 538 and all that, but they also have it in connection with our repeat of history. Right. So is this with Parminder another counterfeit reform line similar to that that we're seeing with Fatima? Okay, it's similar, but there are some differences. So one of the things about this reform line is that... Um, it's a reform line that we were a part of, that is, this movement was a part of um, in relationship to time setting. So we might say it's a time setting reform line, but Parminder's behind it and there's false ideas mixed with the true. So, I mean, it, it's a counterfeit, but it also is a real reform line. That is, we could take this reform line and we could just even take Parminder out of it um, in some ways, not completely. But we could see it as a reform line dealing with November 9th, right? So that it's it's giving us the reform line of November 9th using this reform line starting in 2014. Parminder would still be a part of it, but we, we wouldn't necessarily address his, his um, false prophet aspect of it. But, but the thing is, he is a false prophet that's connected with a real reform line because we're zooming into... Uh, a real way mark in our reform line that is resuming into 2014. Now we never really knew what to do with 2014 and, and Chalatu had the right idea. It's unfortunate that Parminder was able to chase him away. Um, and, and I knew he had an idea there and I knew that it related to how we understand these lines. That is, how do we understand um, 
Well, this is this is the problem that Jeff and I were facing in 2018 and even earlier, but we discussed it at length in 2018 because Jeff was dealing with Samuel Snow's letters. He finally understood them and he was presenting them in 2018. But one of the things about Samuel Snow's letters is it's definitely a reform line, but it begins before 9-11, 9-11 being April 19th, right? So it begins before there. But then in order to understand Samuel Snow, Snow's letters then, we'd have to understand that 9-11 has two different ways in which we can place it. Right, because we can place that symbol um, as something that uh, that happens earlier as the empowerment of the first angel. That is, it represents August 11th, 1840. It doesn't just represent April 19th. And so when we look at Samuel Snow's letters, they occur after August 11th, 1840. So that means in that context, Samuel Snow's letters, just like we're looking at this line here, are happening after the empowerment of the first angel. And his letters are about the arrival of the second angel. We, we can see that quite clearly because he's then going to, to, to give the midnight cry, but it's gonna develop in his letters. So when we look at the history of 2014, if we put it here instead of 9-11, we're seeing that 2014 is representing this line here. This line here from 2014 to 2019 is a zoom into this way mark of sunset. That is, that's what we experienced. We also can call it the prediction before midnight. Now, what we then try to argue is, well, if November 9th is, uh, is going to be midnight, so we would look at these lines and we would say, uh, we're going to have November 9th is going to be raffia, and then we had July 18th as the midnight cry. I would think that's actually a zoom into this way mark of midnight. So that is, I believe we're actually in this way mark of midnight in this movement presently because we had a reform line that was a zoom into this way mark 2014 which was all about parminder and his time setting but that zoom in led to uh, this tearing time that we're in and now in a sense we are we are at boston but we're we're a zoom into a way mark, it doesn't mean that this way mark has been fulfilled. Once this work is done in this movement, then we will have we will have fulfilled midnight. We'll have come to midnight because at midnight we're going to have a message that we can proclaim. It won't be empowered yet, but at least we will have a message. The message will be formalized, and we can clearly see that the message has not yet been formalized that this movement is going to give to the Levites. Correct? I agree with that. Yeah. So, so that's why you know, there's a lot going on here, and I know it's maybe hard to follow, but that's the way that I would understand this, is that right now, when we're looking at this, this way mark, which, which I believe that we're zoomed into, we're zoomed into the arrival of the second angel. It is what we would call sunset. Now here we have 9-11, you know, I put it back in there because this is uh, the way this line's structured. But as far as how we understand a line, there is a line, and, and this may not even necessarily be this line that we have here, may not necessarily be uh, the line we think it is, that is, it may be, um, there may, it may be zooming into a way mark on, on another line that actually extends from this line, that is, uh, 
For instance, we know that the Sunday law, which is a line on Ellen White's line, or a way mark on Ellen White's line, it's going to be a way mark way past 1844, that this reform line here, this repeat of the first and second angel's message beginning at 1989 and going to the Sunday law, is simply a zoom into the Sunday law. Right? That's what we understand now. And that this is not, none of these way marks are on Ellen White's line. She doesn't, other than that she suggests that the first and second angel's messages have to be repeated. We can't take these way marks and put them on the big line. We can't put 9-11 on Ellen White's line. We can't put midnight and the midnight cry on her line. We can't put the time of the end on her line because the time of the end on her line is 1798. And when she looks forward to see the Sunday law, she's not looking at our line. She's looking at a way mark. Our line is simply a zoom into that way mark. That is, this reform line that Jeff had been teaching for so long is actually the Sunday law. But it contains a repeat of the first and second angel's message to prepare a people for the Sunday law. But we can then see that we can't possibly have reached midnight yet. So, so I'm not sure how this is going to unfold as we go through the judges, because we have all of these enemies. But we could say from 9-11 um, to midnight is the period of the judges, maybe that we are experiencing. That is, it's not even going to go to the Sunday law because it's about this movement. And this movement is going to, at some point, which we will call midnight, have a formalized message that it will give. But in order to do that, it has to first conquer these enemies. And these enemies have been left to prove us, to test us. And so what we, when we put those enemies on this line starting at 9-11, um, you know, it's understanding 9-11 first as the empowerment of the first angel, because historically in this movement, we never understood that 9-11 was the arrival of the second until quite a bit later on. So when 9-11 happened and the first angel's message is empowered, uh, this is a message of repentance. It's Othniel. But then we're going to have, you know, Ehud and then Shamgar. And, and now we have uh, Barak and Deborah that we're studying. But this has to be about the message, uh, countering the message of Parminder, which is a dispensationalist message. It's a message that's a rejection of the foundation of Adventism. And it's the enemy that's been oppressing this movement and still is oppressing this movement in that we have not really shook the, the underlying premises, the error. Um, like the time setting? Well, time setting, yes, but it, it's not just about time setting because Parminder introduced time setting, but time already was in our movement. So time wasn't the issue. It's how he interpreted it and it was a dispensational argument that is what he had said is we basically can reject um the spirit of prophecy because she's just a woman writing in the united states in the 1800s and she doesn't have the light that we have in our time and this type of dispensationalism occur, occurs and exists within Adventism still. You'll yes. still see people who are saying, well, Ellen White didn't have light on feast days, right? Or she didn't have light on this, or she didn't have light on that. And so we have new, new light, and we can now say that this new light is, is, is what we're going to follow. But that's, she says new light never abandons old light. It actually makes it shine brighter. So something that claims to be new light, but rejects old light, isn't new light at all. 
So I thought new light was the unfolding of old light. Yeah. Yeah, it's the unfolding of established truth. Quick question. Yeah. Um, have you put any significance to um, the reverse of 9-11 on November 9th? Got 11-9 there instead of 9-11. Uh, that date, November 9th, 11 Nine. Yeah, we know that. Yeah. Okay. Is is there any significance to this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We've already understood the significance of it. Okay. Yeah. You're not familiar with that that we understood. Uh, well, I do recall um, in a couple of the. I'm sorry. I've I've heard in a couple of the. Um, documentaries uh, from Jeff, I did, I did, he did touch that for a moment. Yeah, because um, they're, they're the same symbol, whether it's 9-11 or 11-9. Yeah, okay, so that's what I thought. All right, thank you. Yeah, so for instance, the 11,900 days um, that is uh, connected with, because um, that's 391 months, 11,900 days. Um, connected with the prophecy of Josiah Litch, I mean, it's it's pointing to uh, August 11th, 1840. That's what it's going to lead us to. But August 11th, 1840 is tied up with 9-11. But then we also have 11-9, which starts our reform line. And we got November 9th, right, 30 years later. So, so those are all related. We, we can't sort of just say, well, 9-11 is not the same as 11-9. They're, they're still the same symbol. And, and we know it's a mirror. It's right? just a mirror image of it, that's all. No. So when Trump was at NATO, do you remember Trump being at NATO? Yes, I do. And you remember that he had on one side of him, he was a chiasm, right? He had uh, some of the Berlin Wall there. And then he had some of the pillars from the Twin Towers on the other side. And he talked about these two pivotal events in history. So he was between 11-9 and 9-11. Right. Right. So, so that is uh, a chiasm. <clears throat> okay, so. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. So. So this is what I'm proposing, is that, that Parminder's line, whatever we want to call this, this time-setting line, that's leading to November 9th, it's based on false principles. That is, the arguments he used for time-setting were a dispensational argument, which is uh, basically a rejection of Adventism. And, and it's a zoom into the arrival of the second angel on this particular line. Um, and if and and then when I say this particular line, this line where 9/11 here should actually be sunset. That is, I'm taking this line where 9/11 is the empowerment of the first angel. And so we still haven't decided when we can make 9/11 the arrival of the second angel, because because it can't be both at the same time. I mean, it can. That is, we bring them together, we join these two together. They 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 be become the same symbol. Um, and we have that idea with midnight as well. Boston and Exeter are really one symbol because they're a doubling of a symbol. But here, 9-11 is something, that, something else that we haven't fully understood. Now, of course, when we look at Parminder's line here below, below, we can see that this begins at 2014 at the end of these two time periods, which is why we, we need it to be this uh, 2014 as being the arrival of the second angel. It doesn't, it doesn't get rid of the fact that 9-11 that is the arrival of the second angel, but we have to know in which context we make it the arrival of the second, and in which context it's the, context it's the empowerment of the first. But if we have the empowerment of the first being 9-11, this arrival of the second angel has a role for 2014. And that's this. 
So 2014 is introducing something that Parminder had predicted, which he called the Sunday Law. And you can see that there's some similarity there to what Jeff was doing in that he was always looking for the Sunday Law. But what showed up instead was 9-11, right? Which was unexpected. Suddenly and un unexpectedly, something happened that prior to 9-11, Jeff wasn't expecting. So, so now we have this 2014 and it's gonna lead us to 2019. And that's gonna create this separation or this closed door. And Parminder's gonna and his group are gonna have the door closed upon them. And and we looked at the two 9-11 prayers of Jeff line up with these two 9-11s here. Uh, here we have the ordination of Miller that lines up with Parminder's ordination. Jeff doesn't get ordained, but he does have uh, the Time of the End magazine, which is the formalization of the message. And um, then we can see that we, we can look at what happened in uh, 2018 with October 3rd and October 13th, something that Parminder rejects. Um, and then the 391 and a half days from October 13th as part of this history and that 126 days. So this is part of that structural chiasm um, that we had. And even when we look at things like November 9th and we look at this line, we actually have little way marks or, or this way mark becomes a reform line that we could address. That is, it contains part of this reform line. Now, I know that's a little bit, you know, as far as what we're going to get done today, we're not going to, to have that all sorted out completely. But we should be able to see then that the movement right now has to be past November 9th and that this midnight way mark is, is something that this movement is now involved in. And we just, we haven't formulated this line yet. We don't, we haven't drawn it out. But I think what we will see as we look at the judges, we will start to be able to see how we can take these, um, these judges and the response and that we can see a parallel to, to that history. Now, so this is, so this is Parminder's reform line. But I do think the Judges Chapter 4 goes beyond this, right? That is, we're arguing it goes to at least 2023. So Parminder's reform line is, is counterfeit reform line. It, it contains way marks that are part of our reform lines that this movement has experienced. But it's it's not complete. That is, it comes to the arrival of the third angels, November 9th. But we know that we always have, after the arrival of the third angel, a repeat of history. And so we, we, we can actually see this when we get through these other judges. We're going to start to see what we're going to do is that we're going to zoom into different aspects of the experiences that we've already had. The, the crises that have occurred in this movement are going to be illustrated in the judges. So um, any thoughts on that at this point? It is a bit much. Um, you just have to break all this stuff down. I can see where you uh, have the midnight, uh, not the midnight cry, but it's midnight. Mm -hmm. And it does, it, it, every time that we see things, we. We can't actually go into it and uh, make another reform line in that. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's, it's just now we need to walk through that. And yes, I, I believe Judges is going to tell us some more interesting things. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So we have 
Now we have this message of Barak and we have Deborah. So we're going to say that Deborah is uh, the spirit of prophecy or represents the message of the spirit of prophecy, not Ellen White as a person. <clears throat> uh, what does it mean she dwelt under the palm tree? So we had this discussion before. We know that this isn't talking about the city of palm trees. It's not Jericho. So what does that mean? We have connected it to being like a waymark. Okay. You have a, like a line, and then you have a summit being righteousness. Right. And okay. And so what waymark is it between Rama and Bethel in Mount Ephraim? Well, it sounds like mid midway. Okay. So is, it also, is it also a symbol of where water can be found between the church and the state? Okay. So, so I'm saying that it symbolizes, at least my view is that it symbolizes midway, uh, which is the Sunday law or the cross, right? Um, where water can be found so that there is... Um, uh, water representing, in this case, a message. Is that what you're, or the Holy Spirit? I'm I'm speaking of the living water. Okay. I mean, yeah. We we have so much of a message that has been within the corporate church, but it's a very confusing message because it relies too much upon literal aspects and not upon the symbolism. Okay. It's not relying on Miller's rules. It's relying upon the Protestant methods of biblical interpretation. Can we say that's uh, by sight? It'd be another way of looking at it. Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's man's thinking. It's definitely the, the argument is that in order to understand theology in Adventism, you have to be a scholar. You have to go to the schools. You have to be taught by good teachers. And, and until you do that, you have to accept what the leadership says. Wait, I'm just, I'm just quoting Parminder. Um, uh, but really, Parminder is teaching exactly what the church taught, right? Right. Accept what we say because you don't know the rules. You don't understand the methodology. And until you do that, until you go to our schools and get approved, you really can't know the truth for yourself. And that, of course, is the error, because God can teach the humblest of servants his truth. He can give them the message of the day, even though they have not been trained in the schools that are approved by the church. Well, when Christ came, that that uh, actually threw all that stuff in the soup because um, those there was not most of those guys were uneducated um, that educated themselves of the word. Yeah. Um, and Miller was another example, although he did have credentials, he went into it. But when he got his credentials, wasn't he um, observing the truth? At that point, yeah, he well, he was already presenting the message for two years. Right, right. Now, uh, another thing, uh, just um, so one of the things that we don't want to fall into the trap, though, is that somehow, since scholarship is bad and people are going to be misled by going to university and all that type of thing, that somehow we should just approach things. Um, sloppily and ignorantly and just sort of allow you know god just to speak to us you know that we're just gonna you know pray on our you know in our bedroom and all of a sudden we're gonna have all this light given to us and other people should just listen to us because we're a prophet or something right so that's often what what people go to this sort of other extreme but we can see in miller's rules that one is there is an effort in study 
So we don't just wait for God to give us light. We actually have to seek for it. We have to dig for it. And we also know that um, that the the role of fellowship, the role of the movement is important because remember Barak is not going to move without Deborah and Deborah represents the Holy Spirit the spirit of prophecy guiding the church it's judging the people so a person is an independent in understanding truth he is dependent he's dependent upon God and also God leading others Right. There are many people who want people to follow them, but they're not really worthy to be followed because they haven't learned to follow themselves. They haven't learned to follow Christ. They haven't learned of his spirit, of his character. And they want a shortcut. And, and there is no shortcut. It's the cross that we have to experience. And that's the death to self. So I agree. God is not, God is not going to sanction. He's not going to give light to somebody. And that person not experience the cross in order to deliver that light. Everyone who takes up the cross is then a messenger of Christ because they're revealing Christ. So it's not about the intellectual ideas things that we see on the lines and the numbers and all those things that qualify us to be messengers of God. It has to be an experience and, and, and we have to have the patience to allow God to work and accomplish his work. We cooperate with him, but it's his work that we're cooperating with. He's not cooperating with us. We're co cooperating with him. So, so we have this message, the spirit of prophecy, we have the Bible, we have the Holy Spirit, we have this cross that we have to take up. This is Miller's rules. And, and this message comes to Barak. So Barak, the son of Abinoam out of Kadesh Naphtali, and he's going to have this message. So Barak would represent who? Or what? The movement? Okay, so it would be the movement. But remember, Parminder has a reform line, and he's part of the movement, right? And, and in a sense, yes. his reform line is a reform line that this movement passes through, and, and the movement is oppressed by this message it's a it's it's an oppression but it was sent to test us or to prove us okay so angela has a reference which i don't so she says judge four to five so because it's the number 45 has to do with um trump and the 1290 and the 1335 so she would have to explain what she means by that. Are you talking about Collins? Uh, yeah, uh, more or less. I was just focusing on the on the four five and the forty five of Trump and you know the twelve ninety to the thirteen thirty five. Yeah, yeah, because Colin did a presentation on that, which I don't necessarily disagree with him, but I think he's missing out certain elements. So yeah, so 45 deals with that uh, that period of time, um, which I think is Trump. So, and I would argue, I, I would say that he's correct in that sense, but Trump is not 46. And, and he's not gonna just continue to be 45. He's not gonna become president again. So, so his line was okay. It's just how he interprets it that didn't really make any sense. But anyway, so 
So you're connecting this to Trump. It's in that period of time, the time of Trump. And I would agree that it's uh, definitely, uh, there is the message that's going to counteract what Parminder is doing. Now, when we take the message of Trump, so we have, tr we have Parminder. He set a date, 2014 for the Sunday law. That date passes. And he ends up becoming ordained in this movement on February 27th, 2016. And so when he's ordained, um, is he really interested in what Jeff is presenting? Let's put it that way. Is, is that Parminder's message? Repeat that, please. Is Parminder, because he's interested in time setting, is he really interested in what Jeff is presenting? Well, he didn't show the tendency from what I can understand from your conversations and others' conversations. Yeah. So he had an agenda. He had a way that he already saw things. And 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 I, I would say to some degree he just put up with what he would consider Jeff's nonsense, because he was not a conservative. He didn't look at things the way that Jeff did. He doesn't believe in a Sunday law, right? He has this other agenda altogether. And time setting is part of that agenda. But that agenda is really to make him the leader of the movement. But he's much wiser than people like uh, Mark Bruce or others before him who just thought that they could proclaim themselves as the leader and everybody would follow them. So, so he worked deceitfully behind the scenes, had special groups, you know, a secret study group that he could study with. Um, that weren't going to spill the beans, so to speak, with a plan of what he was going to do. And that was to take over the movement because the movement had to go a certain direction. And but we we can see that the message that was given to Jeff. Not just about Trump, but in other other parts of the message, were actually going to counteract what Parminder was doing that they were going to lead to a direction that ended up going contrary to Parminder's uh, course. But Parminder was going to utilize these, even though he didn't agree with them. Um, he was a strategist and who could take things that he didn't agree with and use them to manipulate people and then twist these things around for his purposes. But God's purposes ultimately were worked out. So when she sent and called Barak the son of Obinim out of Kadesh Naphtali, it would have to be not just a, the movement itself, it has to be a message. And, and this message is... I think the message of July 18th, countering the message of November 9th. Even though it accepts November 9th, it's going to really undo uh, all of the things that Parminder wanted to accomplish with his prediction and Tess's prediction. So when we have 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun, what is that message then uh, being, what's, how is this symbolizing this message of July 18th? Or the message at least of chronology of time in counter to Parminder's message.
anybody. I haven't got a clue, but I'm willing to listen to whatever you have to say about it. Or as Dave, as uh, Dwight said, flesh out more. Okay. So just on a simple level, when we deal with Naphtali and Zebulun, we know that they count these these people, right? Right. And right. we already had a a mark that is if you took Zebulun and you counted backwards from Zeb from July 18th, 2020, and you take 57,400 days for the 57,400 men of war of the tribe of Zebulun, you're going to come to the last day of the, the general conference in 1863, right? Correct. Okay. So we're going to take Zebulun and Naphtali and tie them together, right? Okay. Now, um, so if we do this, I'm just trying to find my numbers here. Um, I always have trouble finding this drawing. So when we do Naphtali, um, what I had done is from November 13th, 1833 to January 27th, 1980, it's going to bring us to the year 1980. And that's going to be, so this is the study here. I'll just go here. So this is the study dealing with Odilia's study. So Odilia is going to take Zebulun and he's going to count back 57,400 days. And that's going to bring us to this conference here. And what, what this allowed, what Odilia study allowed, is us to look at uh, these numbers as periods of time. And he has all these symbols of July 18th. And he has here the, the earthquake, the dark day, and the falling of the stars. So I'm going to count from the falling of the stars 53,400 days, and that's going to bring me to the year 1980. January 27th, 1980. It's going to be 197 days before the falling of the stars that I experienced personally. That is the exact number of days that the manna fell. I'm going to count from August 11th, 1840 to July 18th. So that's going to be a symbol. So we can see that we can take these periods of time. Now, we can also then go to the last day of the General Conference in 1888. And we can use Reuben, and we can count Reuben's number. That's 46,500 days. And that's going to bring us to Parminder's ordination on February 26, 2016, right? And then also that 100th of that 46,500, that is 465 days from Parminder's rebellion to uh, the declaration of December 6, 2020. So, so if we're going to just look at that, so we're just going to address this as a symbol then, this 10,000 from the tribe of Zebulun and the tribe of Naphtali, so it's 10,000 altogether, so we don't know how many from each tribe, but it's going to represent time. So can we say that the representation, the symbolic representation of time is the counter message to Parminder's time setting. Yes, we can. Okay, because Parminder's time setting is dispensational time setting. I mean, I'm not even sure, you know, and remember he's gonna use 1863 and 1888, right? So, so the fact that we can now use Zebulun and Naphtali and tie them to time, and we can we can tie them to these uh, these events, and we can use Reuben and tie him to the last day of the general conference. 
So we're going to use the, the years and the events that Parminder comes up with the year 2014. We're going to use those symbols and we can see that, that that's what this message is about. So it's the message relating to the symbolic use of time that's really going to counter what Parminder is doing. He has a completely different methodology of what he is doing. Even though he's using symbolic time, he's using it only when it's to his advantage. He's not really looking at what God is saying. He is, he's using it for selfish purposes. And so we have this message now. And that's the message that's going to counter what Parminder is doing. Now, Parminder is, of course, his message is typ typified by Sisera. Now, Deborah says, I will draw unto thee to the river Kaishan, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. But Barak says, to Deborah, I will not go. Only if you go with me, then I will go. But if thou will not go with me, then I will not go. So what is this message doing? If a message can do things, what, what is the, the significance of this message? Is this message dependent upon the spirit of prophecy? Um, Deborah's and Barak's, yes. Yeah. So, so we know when Parminder presented his time setting, even before I knew of November 9th, I already had understood that Ellen White's counsel against time set setting stood. That is, we could not make a dispensational argument. We would have to say that Ellen White is correct. We cannot set time. And I was pretty firm on that position. So, I understood that time was a part of our message, but I understood that it existed because we were in a symbolic line. So the arguments that I made with people on Facebook, we started saying, well, your group is doing time setting. And I would say, we're not rejecting Ellen White's counsel. We recognize that this is existing in a symbolic manner within our movement and that it probably just relates to our movement itself, even if external events are connected with it. That this is not anything on the big line, that we're in a typical line. That was my argument. And I stuck to that this whole time because I believe in the spirit of prophecy and I can't undo Ellen White's statements. I'm not going to reinterpret them and twist them. And I'm not going to just simply out and out reject them. I have to understand them. And that's what this movement has tried to do. But we have had two ways in which uh, this was done. Parminder's way, which was basically dispensational, and the other way to accept the spirit of prophecy. But many people haven't really resolved that, is that they haven't spent the time to understand it. They, they sort of try to reinterpret her sayings, um, so a mixture of some of Parminder's idea, ideas. Um, but Deborah says, I will surely go with thee. And notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So it's kind of interesting. Um, was the message of July 18th uh, to anyone's honor? Has that man been glorified because of the message of time? No, no, I have to say no. Yeah. So, so Sisera is going to be uh, delivered into the hand of a woman. We haven't really decided what that means yet. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm not sure what it means. I mean, a woman usually represents a church. And, and maybe that's what that does mean. Um, but Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So that's... Uh, Kadesh Naphtali. And, and Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Right? So, so we know that this is 
this battle between two ideologies that are happening, this enemy that's, that's come in, which is Parminder's message, and this message related to time that's based upon a correct understanding of time, that it's symbolic, that we're not predicting actual events on the line. That it's a message, an objective message, given to us to analyze what's happening within this movement and where we are on the lines. And then we have Heber the Kenite, right? So I think this specifically refers to the message of July 18th itself. And, and one of the things has to do with the word tent and the word um, zaneum, zaneum, right? So this word here, if you remember correctly, remember what we said uh, previously, uh, what does it represent? Okay, the gematria is 65. So I know this is still, every, everybody may not fully understand this. So it's 65, and his tent is his home on the plain of Zanaim. And the way that I interpret this, this is my home address. Because a tent is the number 168, which is the number of hours in a week. But also 168 times 77 is my home address, 12936, when I grew up as a child. And Zanaim is 65, 65 Street. So this is my address. This ref relates to a message that's specifically tied uh, to me as a person. Doesn't mean that I'm Heber, you know, but there's a message that's symbolized and Heber is the one that gives that message. Yeah, and, we firmly come up with, we are not any of those individuals, but the movement um, right. is. Yeah. yeah, so just one of the interesting things, which, because um, I know about this number 12936, I've known it for a long time. I understand it has all kinds of symbolic aspects to it. Um, but this is the line of Pius the Sixth and William Miller. So I'm just going to quickly go through this. Pius the Sixth is born December 25th, 1717. Uh, a doubling and also an important date. He becomes cardinal on April 26th. That's the 26th day of the fourth month as a symbol. He becomes Pope on February 15th, 1777. He's going to be captured on February 15th, 1798. 23 year, it's his 23-year anniversary of being Pope that he's taken captive by Berthier. And that's going to be William Miller's 16th birthday. And possibly William Miller gets his concordance on that day. I'm not certain. I can't prove that. But possibly he got his concordance as a birthday present in 1798. And, but when we go from the time of the end and we use my street address, it brings us to July 18th, 1833. Now on July 18th, we already have from Miller's birthday, which is in February 15th, 1782, that has the symbols of 18720. If you count 1800 and 18,720 days, it brings you to May 19th, 1833. May 19th is a symbol for the dark day, which happens in 1780, another symbol for July 18. But nothing happens on May 19th, 1833 that we know of, but it, it stands there as a symbol. And so 1833 happens to be 187 years before 2020. But if I count from the time of the end, my, my address, it comes to July 18, 1833, which is exactly 187 years to the day before July 18, 2020. And we have Miller's ordination, and we have uh, here the actual date for the falling of the stars, November 13, 1833. So 
what I'm saying is that this July 18th date is tied to this symbol that we can address that shows up here with Heber. So I know it it's, it's, could be rather obscure to some people, but we don't really even need that. I'm just saying it's there. We would have to say that this message, and, and it's in 411, so for me, that's a, uh, another personal symbol of me because that's the marriage of Heidi and myself, April, or not, it's not our marriage. Our marriage is uh, April 8th and it's her birthday. So 411 is his birthday. So it's tied together. Uh, we were married three days before her birthday. And um, so we're going to deal about Heber, but it's going to be his wife. So I'm not saying that the wife is then uh you know heidi right so we're not we're not making that kind of argument but there's a symbol there that we would understand is this making sense to people well it makes more sense than you did uh when you first presented it because first of all you didn't uh you kept calling it a birthday instead of his anniversary i <laughs> yeah. remember that clearly yeah, i know yeah um, i get it. yeah but anyway it, it makes it makes it does sense. make more sense it does make more okay. sense now yeah. And so so we would say that there's this message that's symbolically represented here. And it, and it symbolically is just tied to me, the person who came up with July 18, 2020. Um, but that's that's something that we found that exists. So it's not like, you know, I created this and that makes me Hebrew the Kenite. Right. So we're all clear on that. That That's people right, are symbolized we messages are found symbolized. snows uh, lines well as well. We define snows lines as well. Just like he was there, um, yeah. it makes sense. We see Parminder in here. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, seeing you in here makes sense. Right, and and it's it's a message that's counter to Parminder's. Right. So now we know right. the glory is going to go to the wife of Heber. Well, that's not going to be a person. That woman is going to represent a church or a movement, right? Uh, that's the word I would use. Right. Yeah. So they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Obinuam, was gone up unto Mount Tabor. Now, we're not sure who they are. Um, we're not sure if it's just referring to another group of people that's not really mentioned. Because it can in Hebrew, it doesn't have to refer to anybody who has been mentioned like we do in English. Um, you don't have to mention them by name or anything like that in Hebrew. You can just say that it's just a group of people showed Sisera, right? Now it could be, um, you know, the Kenites, or it could be, you know, any of these people mentioned before. But I think it's just somebody pointed out to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera is going to gather together his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kaishan. So we already had these 900 chariots mentioned earlier, right? So that was in Judges chapter 3, these 900 chariots. Yeah, yes. And, and so now they're going to be mentioned again. And we also have the river Kaishan mentioned. So how do we deal with these symbols here? So we had this idea that Kaishan is winding. Um, it's like a serpent, right? That's the kind of idea. It's like a trap. The equivalence to Dan. To Dan, the backbiter, the serpent that biteth. The heel. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Could be. 
that definitely it, it would fit. I still don't know what the 900 chariots are. I mean, I know what 900 chariots are, but what are they as a symbol? They're chariots of iron, and the iron we would relate to the papacy, right? To Rome. That's and our Rome. understanding. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily, you know, when it comes to 900, though, I mean, I, I'm not really sure what this, why this number, because it doesn't seem to me like a number that we normally see as a symbol. Okay, so Ran had noticed something in 1 Kings 1840, is that it? Dealing with, um, state. okay, so we have here, and Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Now, 1840, what is that? That has, the... has to do with which is Okay, I heard two people talking at the same time. So, Angela? Which, in, in 1840, the fulfillment of his prophecy. Okay. So, August 11th, 1840, uh, Iran puts the year-day principle, is established there. And, and we can see that Parminder is going to be destroyed because of the prophecy of Josiah, right? both in the sense of from the book of um, um, uh, Ezekiel, right? That application and also from Revelation chapter nine, Josiah Litch. So in both senses, the prophecy of Josiah the, the king and the prophecy of Josiah Litch. And so that's where they're going to slew or kill. He slew, um, in this case, here we see Elijah kills these prophets, right? The false prophets. And that's going to be the case in Judges, right? Sort of. I mean, there's going to be more to it because you're going to have Jael who's going to kill Sisera. But that's where they're going to have this battle. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? Now, this day is July 18th. Would we agree with that? He would fit. Okay. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. Now, we haven't really dealt with this yet, What, why he lights off his chariot. So, so Sisera has a chariot. So what is this chariot? What is that? representing could that have something to do with the false wheels within wheels the misinterpretation of prophecy hmm. okay so false wheels within wheels and I think there's a Greek myth or something that says the sun rides around in a chariot. I mean, it's, this is, has to do with sun worship, which is connected with the papacy. Okay. 
Well, I do know if you take the word chariots, so you have the S on the end, and you look at the gematria, it's 216, which is a doubling, or, or not a doubling, but 6 times 6 times 6. So cube root of 6. Um, but that's the word chariots. So we have some symbolism there that maybe could apply. It might be a bit of a stretch. Um, but we have 900 chariots. And I, I don't have what 900 symbolizes. Would that be 45 times 20? Okay. Well, that's true. It's 45 times 20. But I'm not sure how that would then represent Parminder's message. Okay. 45. Where's the 20 years you're talking about of oppression? Well, you've got the, the 20 years of oppression, but isn't there also 20 geras to a shekel? Okay. So, so that's part of Parminder's prediction? His and then, okay, but your 45 is also related to the 1843 chart. Yeah, but it's also related to Trump. And, and, and we could look at it, the 900 chariots and the 20 years that are mentioned. Um, so we could see that that was... Uh, Hmm. I don't know. <sighs> okay. Any other thoughts on that? Twenty years between two thousand one and two thousand twenty one. Yes, but also we we showed the twenty years um, in one of my diagrams where we are dealing also with the twenty months. Yeah, so the twenty years. Um, so there's 20 prophetic years. It leads us to May 29th, 2021. There's 105 days left to September 11th, 2021. And that becomes a symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month. There's, there's a lot involved in this. And also dealt with the 20 months and the 200 months. And so I'm not going to go into that whole study here at this point. Um. But yes, so we, we can look at this 20 years as referring to the period of time in which Parminder's influence um, is symbolized. Yeah, if you look in chat there, 900 times 24 is 2,600 hours. Well, that would go with the gematria for chariot. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good witness there. Okay. So, so somehow this is symbol, symbolized um, with these 900 chariots, whether it's the power of the state, um, the manip which, which is I would take the chariots would represent that. That is, we see what happened with that they're acting like the papacy and they're using uh, physical force. Um, maybe not physical force, but they're using force to get people to comply. Well, the mention of the chariots as being their fear, um, you would think that the application of uh, uh, literal um, physical fear would be able to be applied there. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Mm 
Okay, so what does it mean that he fled away on his feet? That he was self-reliant rather than relying upon the wheels. Okay, I don't know. That seems rather subjective. But, um, well, when we look at the word uh, regal, it um, it comes from regal, to walk along, but only in a specific application. Uh, and that French word, reconnaitre, to be a tail bearer, that is a slander, to lead about backbite. So does that fit? With Parminder. We've already made that application. I, I would say yes. And then from the chat, as Stephen presented, 900 is 30 squared. Okay, yeah, 30 times 30. So in this in this situation, if if we're going to delve into the words, especially, you know, taking this in the French, the eldest son of the papacy, this would be a good position that this would be more the backbiter, more yeah. like that with Dan. That the and, that was, and that was definitely what was happening with Parminder's side of the movement. So a lot of politics a lot of character assassination, things weren't done in the open, lots of secrecy, uh, deceptive uh, communication. So when I you know, talked to Parminder directly, not giving me a single hint that, of anything that he's thinking and just affirming, oh, I don't worry about you, you're okay, don't think that you know I'm against you or anything like that. All this sort of um, kind of things that are happening um, but yet his actions betraying his words. So. So he yeah. held his information close and really didn't want to disseminate anything. Right. He didn't want people to know what he was doing because that would have undone his plans. So the people he considered to be the enemies, he lied to their face, which he admitted. So I'm not accusing somebody of being a liar. He, he actually told us this, that he used deceit. Um, so anyway, that's the, it's nine o'clock. I know we didn't really get very far, but we are going to have to look at Judges chapter five. So in a sense, we're just kind of reviewing Judges chapter four. So we, we should continue doing that tomorrow just to kind of get through the end of it. Uh, I mean, there's still details that we've we've read over, but we haven't really understood. And then we have to get to Judges chapter five and go through uh, the Song of Deborah and Barak. So that's going to be, and that's going to give us a bunch of information that will help us understand things as well. Okay, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? One, one final thought, kind of off topic, but on topic as well. Uh, in the Gospels, how many questions was Jesus asked? I don't know. I never counted. It might surprise people to recognize that he was asked 187 questions really oh how do you find that it was interesting because as as i was doing some of the research yesterday there was a post that had been made by a pastor of all things that noted that Christ was asked 187 questions in the gospel, but that he only answered eight of those questions. Hmm. Hmm.
I'll see if those I can dig something two, further up on that. Those are actually two symbol, very symbolic numbers, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just ask again that you can be with us. Thank you for the time that we've had this morning in study. And we pray that you can work in our lives today. Be with each one. May your angels watch over us. And thank you for the light that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.